Right then, we're back with episode 19 now of the Midnight Pod. Again, you'll notice different location as usual we're in our guest Arsalan's beautiful flat in Dubai. Um, I think we got the lighting slightly better than the previous episode, trying to bash out a few potties while out here. Um, another interesting guest, I think this one will be super relevant to a lot of viewers. Obviously we had a few episodes like in the past few weeks that people were complaining about because they weren't like e-com agency specific. And I think that's very much the audience that's currently watching stuff. So point noted um, on the feedback <laughs> there. So yeah, Arsalan is another guest that's like, I guess part of my network. And I'd, I'd actually never met him before I came here. We'd like spoke briefly on Instagram a few times that like, kind of knew of him, didn't really know him, kind of knew what he did, still only kind of know, no, we'll, we'll what dive you do, into it. we'll, we'll dive, dive into, into it. it. <laughs> um, but yeah, super interesting story, I think, just from the, the brief chats we've had off camera and stuff. And yeah, I think it'd be a very interesting episode. And like usual, the first question really is just, who the fuck are you? What do you do? What's your background? And then we can dive into a load of different things because I think it'd be interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, like the more, the more and more I get asked this question, especially like as I've moved out here to Dubai and I've met like higher and higher sort of net worth people, the, the more sort of tame this question, like the answer to this question becomes. Before it'd be like, oh, I have a e-commerce agency and we do ads yeah. and then then I have a e-commerce brand and it's clothing and it does well. And now I'm just like, I just do business. <laughs> that's, that's my answer to most people these days, unless they really yeah. ask about it. Um, I'm really asking about it. Yeah, I know. No, I mean, my journey started about, uh, I would say six, seven years ago, um, probably before that, but I would say like, when I really started taking business seriously, it was probably when I was like 18, 17, going on to 18. I started trying to do like Amazon FBA. Um, I had like a little graphics agency that I was doing for YouTubers, just creating like banner work and stuff like that, probably making like 1K a month from that, which was good money for like a 16, 17 year old. Um, but I always had this dream in my head of like, you know, this is the lifestyle that I want, the kind of apartment, the kind of car, kind of yeah. spending and then, um, I was like, how can I reverse engineer that? And that number to me at the time was like 12K a month. So I was like, what the hell can I do to make 12K a month? Um, so I started Amazon FBA, did decent. It was like two, three K a month, gave up on it. Just wasn't passionate about it when the logistics issues came in. So I was just like, I don't need this headache. Went to uni to try to be a doctor to kind of follow my grandfather's footsteps, which uh, I was passionate about for about two months. <laughs> yeah. got, got into medicine, which is huge in the first yeah, place. That is, I don't um, know. But then the moment I started it, I realized this isn't what I wanted to do. Didn't want to study for like 20 years. Started a marketing agency, focused in the restaurant niche, was working with like about 18, 20 restaurants and around Stoke-on-Trent and London, back to back. So I was always traveling between Stoke-on-Trent and London. Um, and then one day just decided to switch to e-commerce through one of my mentors at the time, because he kind of forced me to switch from the restaurant niche. Marketing, marketing agency was sort of born from there about three and a half years ago when we switched to e-commerce. Uh, the team grew from like five people to 25 people now. Um, and then I started my own e-commerce brands, which was the clothing lines here when I moved to Dubai. Yeah. So uh, in a very short nutshell, yeah, that's who I am. I'm yeah. uh, the guy who has e-commerce knowledge and then his own e-commerce brand now. So uh, yeah, yeah sick. that's me. Going back to before that then, because like your like childhood and where you're from and shit, because I was trying to work out where you were from before we met. Oh yeah. And then where are you from? Then I told you. Yeah, it's yeah, a mix, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's half Russian, half Pakistani. All right, that's an interesting mix, I guess. Yeah. And then you grew up in London or what? So I was born in Russia, lived there for about three and a half years. Then I lived in Pakistan with my grandparents for about one year whilst my dad moved to the UK. And yeah. then after one year, we all moved to the UK. So pretty much raised in London, yeah? Southeast. Yeah, so yeah. whereabouts in London? It was in Greenwich. Oh, so nice. I went to school in Greenwich, yeah. secondary, primary. Then I went to uh, university in Kiel, up in Stoke-on-Trent. Wanted to escape the parents. Stoke-on-Trent? Yeah. I don't put medicine and Stoke-on-Trent together. I didn't know you could do it's, medicine it's, there. It's one of the unis. So Kiel University is like... Because like I, my frankly, like I'll just be honest, right? My grades were not good enough, right, to get yeah. into medicine in like Oxford or like in uh, what was it, King's College or anything like that. Turned me down, so I went into clearing on the day I got my results, and then uh, basically called up a bunch of unis on the day. Was panicking, shitting myself. I was that was it. My life was over. Kiel called me back and they're like, "Hey, we'll give you a place for medicine here." So I was like, "Yeah, okay, cool, done." 
Yeah. And then that was it. I just just went there without uh, without like thinking about it. Didn't even visit the uni. Yeah. Just yeah. literally just went. Did you want to be a doctor? Or is it just like family pressure? Again, I, I did for a while because th- there was this period where after I did my Amazon FBA and then it went from like three k down to like nothing again because I just gave up. I yeah. was thinking like, what do I really want to do with my life? Like, where do I see myself when I'm 25, when I'm 30, 35? And at the time I was pretty good at science. Like I like biology, hated chemistry. So that probably wasn't a good, that was probably a red flag right there, but yeah. didn't really pay attention to it. And uh, I just enjoyed like the whole idea of like saving someone's life. So I wanted to be a surgeon. That was my goal, like a heart oh, yeah. surgeon. Um, so yeah, for like, I would say, yeah, that was my like vision. I was like, I'm going to be a heart surgeon. Worked really hard towards that. And then, uh, then I realized it wasn't for me. Yeah. So did you, did you take a break from like entrepreneurship after the FBA stuff? And yeah, then like yeah, yeah. Went to uni, you finished uni, right? I finished uni, I switched, when, when to, was that? I switched to biomedical science. So I finished that in 2020. Oh shit. Yeah. Pretty recently. So, yeah. so the, the agency overlapped uni then? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll go into that. So yeah. after Amazon FBA, I started uni. I decided just to focus on uni only. So my first year of uni, I just, did the uni experience, right? Yeah, yeah. Freshers, drinking, studying from when I when I could make it to lectures, mm. <laughs> right? But there was a lot of drinking basically. Um, and then after that, like towards the end of that first year, that's when it hit me that I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to work for somebody else. I wanted my own thing. And the Amazon FBA thing was like a foot into that door of like making money on your own and just sort of being free. Yeah. And I was like, I want that, but like times 20. So uh, that's when I just started the, uh, well, I just started like looking online. I remember the moment so vividly, actually. I was in my dorm room. It was like 4 a.m. in the morning. I felt like shit, like men- like emotionally, I felt like shit. Yeah. And uh, I-, I was just like scrolling through YouTube, like on the weird side of the internet. Yeah. And then somehow I got recommended a video of, uh, I think it was Ty Lopez at the time. Like Yeah, classic. Yeah, it was just like how I made like 20K a month or something through th- social media marketing. And I thought, okay, like, cause the way I operate in business is, uh, and the way I've always been is, if somebody's already done it, then there's no reason why I can't do it. Yeah. Right. So at that point I was like, okay, if he's done it, there's no reason I can't do it. So then I just started kind of educating myself on this space for about like three, four weeks, or just getting obsessed with like SMMA videos, any courses that were available for free, I'd pirate them. Yeah. You know, I was just like, check them all out. And then at that point, um, I was like, okay, I've done about like a month worth of like theory. Now I need to put this shit into action. Otherwise I'm not going to do anything. Yeah. So I just started cold calling. That was, that was my intro to it. I would just cold call restaurants and I'm like, Hey, your social media page is, you know, not the best. How about I come in and meet you guys and give you some free advice and then maybe we can collaborate. Um, I probably called about a thousand restaurants, got turned down by maybe 900. Yeah. And then a hundred I had probably meetings with. And then out of those hundred, maybe I closed like, 30, 40 of them at the time. Yeah, it's quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, like I scaled very quickly. Like I was, every day my routine was wake up at like 5 a.m., go to the gym at uni, come home, call about like 50 places, then like start uni work if I had to start uni work or go lectures, Yeah. come back, eat, work on the agency or like service delivery, some yeah. things, and then sleep. And that was like a good like one year of my life. And for those restaurants, was this, like paid ads or literally just running their organic socials? It was just organic. Like yeah. old school. It was organic and then like sometimes delve, like I started delving into paid ads with, through that. So yeah. like they would, they would be like, hey, we have a, the bigger restaurants would be like, hey, we have a budget of like 5K for the next two months. Divide that and like, you know, boost the post or start ads for like this yeah, yeah. new event that we're launching or something like that. So that was sort of my intro into the paid side of things. Before that, it was just all organic. Um, I even like had this university student friend of mine who had used as like a photographer for some of the restaurants. Mm. So I'd upsell them that as a service. And then we'd do like photography and like all that for their was food, it just, food and stuff. Just you and them then? Or was there like a team at this point? If it was like just me clients. at that point, And then he was just like there when I needed photographs, like as a freelancer yeah, yeah. sort of thing. Uh, and then I had like a VA from the Philippines. Yeah, and that was it. And how much are they paying you like per restaurant on average? If there's 30 of them? It was about 500 pounds <clears> to about a thousand pounds, thousand five hundred. So you're like making significant money, like in the first year. Yeah, yeah. So I, I went from like zero to like twenty twenty five k a month, like very very quickly. Yeah. Probably within about six months, I hit I think twenty twenty k. Yeah. And then I got to like twenty five twenty six k. 
then I lost a lot of clients just because I was so like I had scaled so quickly and not hired or had systems for it yeah so I would just get unorganized or if I didn't have time because of uni or whatever going nights out some shit would go down and just, then just forget to do the job yeah I'll just forget to do the job literally it was really bad like I like looking bad at it I apologize to those clients if they ever see this yeah right? like I really do because I probably give them the worst service ever um but yeah and then at one point I had like lost probably about like 10 grand worth of like monthly recurring income within like two nights. Yeah. And then that's when it really hit me that I was like, I wasn't running this seriously enough. Yeah. yeah. Cause I just watched it go from like 24, 25 K down to like 14 K. And then I was so petrified that it might go down even lower. Uh, and then at the time, that's when I started, you know, like systemizing. I hired like more VAs to kind of help me. I had like a guy to post and organize and schedule posts. Um, and, and then, yeah, that's sort of like when I really started taking it seriously. But that was about like a year into the whole agency thing. Yeah. Before that, I was just kind of get as many clients yeah, in yeah. as possible, not really care about what happens afterwards. Yeah, just sort fucking of winging it. Yeah. And how, how long was there left of uni when you're a year into, did you have a year, year left of uni? And no, so out? if I'm a year, so a year into <clears throat> uni, like medicine is six years. Oh, so fuck. yeah. At okay. that point I decided. Yo fellas, quick one. First bit of promo for the pod, you may or may not have heard, I released a fucking e-com course a few months ago. Basically spent like six months making it because I was in between businesses, as you probably know, if you follow my shit. I must say, 12 hours long, it's fucking quality content. I was gonna drop it at like 1500 quid with some bullshit guru-y webinar and all that rubbish, but as you know, it's not my main thing. I'm working on a new brand right now, very, very fucking much in the trenches, which is why I think is actually a better course than everything else out there, because it's built on real experience of my brands in the past and my current one. I think it's super, super valuable. If you're interested in e-com, you're already in e-com, and you want it to get into e-com, zero to one, starting a brand from scratch, then definitely worth investing in. Link is in the bio of this video, or podcast, Spotify, Apple Music, wherever the fuck you're listening or watching, and enjoy the rest of the pod. There's no point in me doing medicine for six years because there's no way I'm gonna last that long. So I spoke to my dad about it and he was like, why don't you just switch courses to a three-year course? So I switched to biomedical science. Yeah. I just listened to his advice on that one. And now I was pretty much like halfway through. It was like January or February when I had this conversation with my dad. So I'd already done like the September, October, November of the second year. Yeah. And then uh, at that point I was like, but I don't see myself like lasting another year and a half, like especially the way business is going. like." My dreams were up here and uni was like down mm -hmm. here, it felt. So uh, he was like, just hire someone. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> so I went to these two medical students who, these two girls who I used to study with, yeah. were good friends of mine. And I just said, look, I'll pay you guys like a thousand pound each if you just do my assignments. Oh, for, I thought you meant hire someone for the business. Your dad was telling you to hire someone to do your work. To, to do my uni work, yeah. So right. they did all my assignments. I got them to sign an NDA. That's the right way around. And everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, no. So then at that point, they just did all my assignments. And my job was just focus on the uni. And the only thing I had to do was come back at the end of each semester and just study and sit the exam. Pass, hopefully. Yeah. And then uh, that was it. So then that's how I finished my diploma. I would literally just have people do my work throughout the year. I would come back for the last week, yeah, study and cram awesome. as much as I could and pass the exam. Did you not just think I'd be better off just sacking this off entirely at this point? Or was it more like a family I did think pressure it. thing? I did think it, but my dad, I mean, he made a good point. <clears throat> he was like, there's a year and a half left. You've already wasted like something like 10 or 12 grand yeah. on uni already. And you've got another 10 or 12 grand to go. And it's a year and a half, technically not even a year and a half because you finish in July, you come back in like October yeah. and then you finish again in like March or like May yeah. or even, I don't even know when it was, but like early into the year. So I was like, fair enough. They, I was like, there's no point in just throwing this out the window now. I'll just get that piece of paper, make, you know, make it look good on paper. If yeah, supposedly yeah. if I ever have to have a CV and then uh, that was it. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I never got my degree. I wasted like two and a half years and I think I'm still paying back fucking student debt. I don't, it's know. Crazy. I don't really look at it but yeah I always thought like could I not just effectively charge that back because I didn't feel like I got any value from it like product not as, not as described just, just stripe payments charge yeah, that back yeah. <laughs> that's probably why they, they don't accept fucking card payments for you know maybe they do I don't know but yeah that's cool and then what was the next step for the agency then so you, you get to a pretty solid level straight away figure out some early lessons yeah so uh, there was one restaurant owner that I used to work with in uh, Hampstead in London. And he had like, I think yeah. two or three of these restaurants around Europe. So there was the only one in London and then he had another, I think in Turkey and another one in Greece or something like that. And uh, he, 
I, I don't know what he was into business wise, but I'm sure he had a lot more than just restaurant money from somewhere. Yeah. So like, he was experienced for sure, like in the world of business, but I really got on with him and uh, I would see him maybe like once every two months because he was just always traveling out the country here and there. And uh, he sat me down when he came back in summer and he was like, look, you're killing it for us, but I want you to switch industries. And that was like a shock to me because I, I was there for like a catch up meeting on like yeah. the reports, etc. Just catch up with him briefly. Uh, I didn't expect him to say, hey, here's a, here's a career change sort of thing. Um, so I was very like taken back by the fact that he just came out with that. And he was like, he was like, I like you a lot. I've been thinking about you a lot, like in terms of like what you do and how you do it. But I think you could do a lot better in other industries. So he yeah. was like, just go home, think about it. Next time we meet in like a month or so, I want you to tell me what your industry is going to be. And I want you to go after that instead of restaurants. And I was like, okay. So uh, I respected the guy a lot at the time. He was kind of like my father figure in terms of business. And uh, I went back, I thought about it. And at the time, like there was this whole, you know, e-commerce boom in the UK happening of like every business sort of switching to online, closing down their retails. Yeah. So that kind of caught my eye. And uh, I thought- Was this 2019 or 2020? This was now 20, like 2019, yeah. Yeah. 2019, like early, early March, maybe 2019. Um, so yeah, at that point I was like, e-commerce. And then I went back, I met him, I think it was in May. And uh, I just said to him like, e-commerce, that's that's what I'm gonna do. I was like, what do you think? And he was like, good choice. And that's all he said. Yeah. He didn't comment on it. I expected him to have like this whole monologue about like, mm. great choice, well Testing done, I'm you. proud of you. He just said good choice and that was it. Uh, and I didn't question him. I didn't ask him like, you know, aren't you going to say more or anything? Because frankly, like, the guy just intimidated me a lot. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was like, okay. And at that point, I just started looking for ways to get e-commerce clients through, you know, LinkedIn, through email scraping, through finding brands through Google. Um, Amazon was a big directory for us as well because a lot of brands are on Amazon, but they don't really have their own thing going. Or if they do, it's not the best. They're still relying on Amazon for most yeah. of their sales. Um, so yeah, that's when the e-commerce agencies sort of like kicked off and then um, I hired my sister at the time for like a summer job just thought she might want some extra cash like help out with like finding leads and like contacting them and then uh, I kind of noticed that she had this really sort of surprising talent for knowing how to systemize and like I was sort of like the big visionary of like this is where I want to get mm. to but she was like but how are you going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G together um, so it ended up being a really good like sort of uh, like we really complimented each other in that sense yeah. of business. And plus she was my sister. So I was like, you know, if there's anyone I can trust, yeah. it's probably you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and then she started taking on more responsibility. Is she older or younger? She's younger, yeah. All right. Okay. So she's yeah, yeah. just turned 20. I'm, 20, oh, I'm 24, turning 25 in like three weeks, four weeks. Um, so yeah, she just started taking on more responsibility. She started hiring a bunch of people and I was like, do we really need this? But she was like, yes. And then we just started expanding the team and it went from like five people to like, 12 people in like a few months. Yeah. And then from there, she became the COO eventually, started handling clients and like operations, communications. And then, yeah, that, that was the so rest of So did you sack off all the restaurant clients overnight then, basically? What, no, what, no, what no, was no, the no. With that? Not was overnight. It like a gradual so like, filter? It was more of like a gradual, like getting rid of sort mm. of thing. So like at one point I said to them like, look, our retainer is now gonna go from like, you know, you're paying us a thousand pound or like 800 pound, 900 pound a month we're gonna have to take it to 1.5. Otherwise, we're gonna have to like get rid of you after like a 30 day notice period. Yeah. Right, because I wanted to just focus on like higher, <clears throat> higher retainers, less clients, but just sort of like within e-commerce now was my focus. So I just said, look, if you can't pay that fee, then I'm gonna have to let you go. So then over time, like as we got more and more e-commerce clients on, like the restaurant sort of got less and less. Yeah, and how did you get the first e-com clients? Was there a different <laughs> approach? Or Good was question. it literally? cold calling emailing again. I think it was just emailing I don't actually remember who the first e-commerce client <clears> was <throat> no it was Upwork it was through Upwork.com oh really yeah yeah so like I, I, I had like a YouTube video that I saw like how Upwork is a great place for agencies so we tried out Upwork and then it was a, an American client in LA which is the reason I went to LA what we were talking about oh, earlier yeah. off camera so uh, he was looking for it was an infra product and he was looking for 
uh, like someone to advertise his courses and then he also had like a product to upsell which was an e-commerce product so uh, we just took him on and that was like my biggest ever retainer at the time it was like 2.6k a month yeah and he had like a spend of I think like 12 15k a month and I was like wow this is a whole new tier of like you know from, from restaurants who pay 800 pounds and now 2.6k yeah, yeah. with one client so I was like this this is it and then uh, yeah and then slowly just we expanded that way do you think and this is going to, well, slightly building on the topic because I feel like agencies I feel, I feel like genuinely people that getting into online business entrepreneurship now even within the past five years but even more so now they, they genuinely either go like e-com whether that's drop shipping building a brand whatever or they start an agency and I think I spoke about it on a previous podcast I think agency is definitely a better like cash flow model and for a lot of people it's probably easier to start like lower cost at least mm-hmm. But now, probably more than ever, and I don't know if you've observed it, I feel like fucking everyone has now got an agency to the point where like, yeah. I must get any at least an email a day, just cold email off an agency and like, yeah. everyone claims to be an expert when they've probably got zero experience, you know? I agree. Has that made it harder or is it just meant that people that are actually good at what they do because of experience, most likely have it e- even easier now? Like, even easier. I, I, so I, fucking I, I find it even easier to be honest and I'm glad you asked this question because I actually really love answering this question it's that I feel like as this sort of like gold rush of mm-hmm. uh, agency hype and like you know yeah. with all these info product gurus saying agency is this biz- best and easiest business model to generate 10k a month and 20k a month I think so, it probably is to be fair I think it is too and I, I still think that it and is one I don't one. have an agency and I'm saying that for an outside perspective <laughs> exactly having gone the e-com like, route e-commerce is definitely a lot harder with like the logistics side of things and like now having my own brand like I really yeah we can come on to that as well I really see like the difficulties of that but with the agency I feel like it's such a not a volatile business model I'm trying to find the word for it it's such a like expansive business model because not only do you get to sort of build on your own personal network if you meet the right business owners and you learn from them and you kind of take the positive side of working with another business, right? Yeah. Instead of just like, hey, you pay me and I do this. Um, not only that side, but you learn so many different skill sets from like HR to managing people's expectations, business negotiations, sales, the actual service delivery side of it, whatever mm. it is, um, knowing what motivates people, knowing how to handle the really difficult situations, how to like avoid lawsuits and all that shit when yeah. things go wrong, right? People don't talk about that side of the agency. Like we had a lawsuit for like 200K at one point, another lawsuit for for 150k another lawsuit for like another 300k what were they surrounding is it like people not paying fees people uh, chargebacks they just wanted to charge back because they wouldn't fulfill their responsibilities as a client right so even though the con- we won by the way for the record we won all those lawsuits right because the contract was very clear of what was our job as an agency and what was their job as a client yeah in terms of what they had to provide etc the issue that i found was as i was working with these brands and we would do a good job for them ads wise so they'd be scaling right as they scaled the cracks in their back end of their business operations would start to come alight and the yeah, issue with I've like been there with my own brands and the issue with like these the, the lawsuits that happen at least with those clients which is a minority by the way i don't want people in the agency model to think that like every big client you're going to get is just going to give you a lawsuit right <laughs> it's just with those clients they were very poorly managed brands and when the cracks came through instead of kind of uh, taking that leadership role of this is my business it's my ship it's my responsibility and my fault right they just wanted to play the blame game of oh you guys are the ones who spent this much money and scaled us to this level so it's your fault right and then when we would fight back and say like here's the facts it's not our fault they would escalate it ego was a big thing involved with a lot of these business owners so they would just try to push it to the maximum um, and then eventually they'd lose anyway because the contract was very clear Mm. the evidence on our side was very clear and the way I've always operated my agency is uh a very transparent approach because a lot of these agencies like as you said more and more are coming about they're just like here you go we work for you has a report every week or every month bye sort of thing yeah. right but I've always wanted to kind of build and facilitate this long term relationship so even if we don't end up working together after six months or nine months I'm still going to be really high in your mind in terms of respect in terms of how we worked with you yeah. that if you see another business owner you're going to refer me or if you have a conversation, you're gonna talk about me when it's ad related or whatever it is, or, you know, we're gonna speak very, very highly of each other until the day we die sort of thing, right? So that's the way I've always wanted to build like the principles of the agency. But uh, going back to what you said on the question of uh, 
has it been harder? I think it's been easier, man, because all these agencies coming about and talking the talk, not really walking the walk. Yeah. It's made it even easier for us as like a, well, so we're a premium partner agency with Facebook now. So we have like the official premium agency badge with Facebook and like direct support with Facebook and the reps. So one, we leverage that a lot because you've got yeah. that status sort of thing. And then two, it helps us out when a client says to me, you know, we got burned before by this agency or they said they did this and this and this. It's very easy for us to then be like, okay, let us look at the ad account. Let's analyze it for a day or two and then come back to you with like the actual points. If you agree with these points, let's work together. If you don't, by all means, take this free advice, go implement it in-house if you wish to, right? So like business owners have loved that approach of like, I'm not just trying to sell them. I'm literally saying, I'm not gonna work with you until I see your ad account, until I see what was done, yeah. the issues. And I know that we can actually make an impact here. Because if I see an ad account and I think there's genuinely nothing we can do here, I'm not gonna take on the client. I'm just gonna say, look, not much we can do here. Here's my free advice on it. But you seem to be okay as it is, or like, you know, unless you change a, to a different product or have better profit margins, yeah. not much can be done ads wise. Um, so yeah, it's been easier. Yeah, interesting. I, I've worked with like seven agencies in the past, literally seven, <laughs> which is probably not, I was probably a terrible client because I came from it, I'd run, millions of pounds of Facebook spend, not Google, but Facebook spend myself previously. So when I then outsource it to an agency, I was probably on my case way more than other clients. Mm -hmm. Cause I was like, right or wrong, I was just like, fuck, this is how I used to do it. I feel uneasy about you doing it a different way or whatever. But yeah. I've worked with some, some good agencies. Um, yeah, I've worked with my mate's agency a lot who have referred loads of people to, still waiting for a fucking referral fee. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, next question leading on that. Do, like obviously I've referred him a lot of work. Do you find that you get more, like do more clients now come from like referrals or otherwise or, and, and, and how do you get clients in general? What's the approach? So there's a few systems that we sort of rely on for clients now. It's, it's definitely evolved as time has gone on in the agency. Now a lot of it is referrals for sure. The second being through our, my sales team, which I have like a separate division in the agency, which we qualify the right kind of e-commerce clients. We see the gaps in the ads that they're already running. So like through ads library, we'll be able to see what yeah. ads they're running, what kind of you know creatives, what where they're running it to, et cetera. And we'd have a very vague idea of like, okay, this is what's going on in their back end, And then we'll reach out to them with a personalized video, which is a loom basically yeah. for like three, four minutes. And that works really, really well. So that's how we've managed to get some really big clients just by sending these personalized videos through email or through LinkedIn. Yeah, I get and loads of those. Talking to the business owner directly. Um, and that, yeah, that's pretty much it, to be honest. Those are the two main ways that we get them yeah. now. As of like speaking of today, like how, yeah, it's, yeah. how it's going down. And how do you decide then, because I've had experience in the past with agencies where it's been clear that they've taken on too many clients because they want more money and then they haven't, the service has gone down, the contact time has been too slow, all this sort of shit, and I've ended up not working with them. How do, you, how do you get that balance right between we want more clients, more revenue, growth, but also actually serving the current clients, giving them the contact time, all that? I think it's just systems, to be honest, man. Like I think a lot of people fail in the systemization of the businesses a lot of the time. And even when they do have systems, they could be way better or way more efficient. Yeah. So I have, uh, I have like my team send me a morning message every single day at 10 a.m. Dubai time. I get a rundown of every single client, what happened yesterday in terms of spend, in terms of ROAS, in terms of any changes, any red flags for me to know about, yeah. or like any queries, or like, you know, if my team's confused about anything for each and every single client, and it takes me maybe like, 10 minutes to read through, but it tells me everything I need to know, right? So at that point in the morning, I'm at that, I have the power of information where I can make a decision of like, okay, client, you know, C, um, this seems a bit off to me. Check it out, look into it, ask them questions, ask them if they need more clarification on anything, you know, make sure that communication is always there. And another thing is, I've always found that even when you do deliver great results for clients, if you're not communicating them, if you're not communicating it to them on a daily basis or a very regular basis, they still ask questions and they still get concerns, even if yeah. you're getting the best results for them, right? So now like I have this very strict sort of SOP of like communication is key. I want clients to message us if they have a weekend plan. I want clients to like, you know, I feel free to ask any question at any point and they know they'll get an answer within a few hours yeah. sort of thing. So having that day-to-day -day communication of, uh, you know, hey, 
how's it going? Just wanted to let you know that this is what happened yesterday. If you have any questions or anything, let us know, right? Pretty much every like two or three days yeah. that is asked in a Slack chat with every single client. In like, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but one way or another, it's like phrase like that. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, and then just having that key communication. So when things are down or if they are slow, when you have like, you know, iOS 14 inconsistencies yeah. or you have like just instability issues or you have a bad day or whatever, people's behavior in the buying market is not as high as it was during Black Friday, for example, at least clients are aware of and they're sort of, you know, we've affirmed it to them enough times that they understand why it's down and they're not like hating on us for it and they're yeah. in a very good position emotionally as well and psychologically, not just in business wise. Yeah, I think communication is so important, like in life. Yeah. Like, like how many cases, uh, like business in this case, obviously, but like how many times relationships, socially, like whatever, have you, I don't know, maybe misinterpreted a text, for example, or not had a reply to a text. So you thought this is what they're thinking. Then actually a few hours later or a day later, you've had an answer in whatever context. Yeah. And you've been like, oh, right, I was completely wrong. If they just told me that originally, it would have been fine. All the time. Because <laughs> happens all yeah, the time. Like, I don't know if that's like it. Yeah. I don't know if social media and like the internet has probably made that. Because obviously by default, people aren't in offices and, and stuff as much. So if you don't send a message, people can't read your mind. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've experienced that with agencies in good and bad ways. Um, but, but communication is so important. You, you don't mm -hmm. want to feel like as a client, you're having to ask all the time it's yeah. better if they can just tell you like you were saying like yeah. a daily update that proactive approach yeah so yeah if anyone's got an agency listen to that i think it's a good point in terms of the team then so how did that i guess start it was obviously just you hmm. but then how has that evolved over the past few years to now and and what does it look like now so in the beginning, it was just me. Then it was just me and some VAs. Then it was me, like I said, with my photographer friend at one point. Yeah. Um, then I switched to e-commerce, so that kind of became irrelevant anyways. But then, yeah, it was just me, VAs. I was doing all the ads. I was learning about how to do ads. And then uh, I had my <clears> first media buyer probably maybe like eight to 12, eight, I don't know, eight, nine months in, I had my first media buyer for ads. Uh, and then at that point, I started like getting more information of like, okay, this is what they're doing differently from what I would have done. Uh, then, you know, fired, hired a bunch of people over the next like sort of year or so. Things really changed once I hired my sister, I would say, because I think she brought in the organizational structure that I desperately needed, but just didn't have the patience or sort of uh, ability to do at the time like I knew it had to be done I just didn't do anything about it yeah it was a very bad place as an agency to be in because you know that it's the one thing that's probably going to scale you long term but you don't want to do it because it's a lot of hard work and it's a bitch to do yeah right so uh part of my language am I allowed to swear on this? I swear okay. all the fucking okay. time right. <laughs> um we're not monetizing this at any point so yeah when I hired my sister that was that was it so she started like systemizing everything I remember sitting down with her at like 1 a.m. at night and then she, we would just be on like a whiteboard like doodling like this is what we want as a goal this yeah. is how many things we need to like send out in order to attract this many clients or how many how to land this many meetings per month and it all just became like a numbers game right and it, yeah it just became like it, get, it became gamified yeah essentially uh and then she started like hiring people for it i started like posting on my instagram stories and on job websites etc i'm looking for this i'm looking for that so over time, we just went through like a bunch of different talent, some good, some bad, some that was great, but just didn't want to stay long-term or just weren't serious enough for the long-term vision. Some that were really bad that we learned a lot of lessons from. And then slowly we went from like me and my sister, a few VAs, to me and my sister, media buyer, to two media buyers, to three media buyers, to more VAs, assistants, uh, you know, organic social media posting person, copywriter, et cetera. And it just sort of expanded that way over the last, I would say two and a half years. And then now we're at 20, 25 people now. We just hired like another five people for the sales side of things, for more outreach and more numbers. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of how it's evolved. So yeah. I would say the main people on my team now is me, my sister who handles like pretty much 90% of what I used to previously do. So that's a big load of my plate because now I actually have time to focus on like the e-commerce brands and other things. Yeah. And then I have my CMO, Joy, who's a, who's a genius when it comes to ads. I've, I've literally never met anyone more impressive when it comes to the knowledge of ads in my life, 
which is insane. And I've spoken to some very big agency owners and their teams as well. So speak very highly of him, but it's for a reason. Like that guy is a genius. Um, so they're like my three, like we're like the top three people. And then after that, we have like secondary media buyers, VAs, assistants, social media managers, copywriters, um, and then the sales team. Yeah. On the media buying side, because I've always, I've debated this a few times and do you think that if, if, if media buyers are so good at media buying, why don't they start their own agency for a start? Or why, why don't they go freelance, whatever it is, mm-hmm. or potentially start a brand? But I think that that's a different issue which we'll get onto. So, yeah, I mean, or, or do you think it just comes down to ultimately some people prefer to work under an organization rather than have the pressure of finding their own? Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it just income. comes down to responsibility and how much you can take. Right, because I think a lot of people forget that when you're when you're a business owner, when you're when you're the top, you know, the top honcho or like you know the leader of the pack, when shit goes wrong, it's on you. Yeah, right? tell me about it. It doesn't yeah, matter. Ruin my life, really. Like it doesn't matter if your media buyer did fucked up, or if your copywriter fucked up, or if you know my sister, the COO, fucked up, or like whoever fucked up. Yeah. Right. Ultimately, it's on me. Like. I'm the leader of the company, I'm the CEO, I'm the one who's managing everything, technically, even if I'm not in the day-to-day yeah. all the time, the responsibility falls on me. And yeah. when shit goes wrong, it can go very wrong. And it can be a lot, like, mentally, the stress of it, there's the, you know, the repercussions of it, it might be financial repercussions, or it might be emotional repercussions, but it's a lot. And I don't think everybody, I think everybody can handle that. I just don't think everybody is in the position to handle it, you know? Cause yeah, like, or ul- wants to, ultimately. Yeah, because I feel like ultimately everybody can be like the best version of themselves, right? But yeah. 99% of society is always gonna choose to be in a very comfortable place. Yeah. Because if you look at you, if you look at me, if you look at most of our circle and the people I know, you know, we're not in the 99%, right? We're in the percent of we've done more with our lives because we wanted to do more, but as a result, we also have a lot more responsibility. So yeah. when, when things go wrong, and you know, you've talked about it as well, yeah. it's like, it can go very wrong, right? Very wrong. No, right, like no average employee is gonna have to deal with that. But you did, Yeah. you know? So I think it's it's mainly that, like people, like even my media buyer, I've actually asked him this question. I've, I've said to him like, you know, what's your goal? Do you wanna leave one day? Do you wanna start your own thing? Um, and he just said to me straight up, he was like, look, I love what I do because he wanted to be a data analyst when he was like studying. So his job was all about the data, the numbers, seeing the patterns and the trends. And that's why he's such a good media buyer. Um, but he's like, I love this, but I get to not only do the data analysis side of things in this job, I get to help other companies grow. I get to have all of this great company culture with you, etc., and build something great, but I'm not responsible if things go wrong. Yeah, and he said that to me very openly and honestly, and I respect him for that, right? Yeah, self awareness, and, and I think it just it just comes back to that. It's the responsibility side of things, you know. Yeah, not everyone can handle it. Yeah, I think I think that point about people just generally, because I think the problem entrepreneurs have, and I've discussed this actually, is that this whole like ninety nine percent, one percent. I mean, that's just like a bit tongue in cheek, but like you forget that to be in the 1%, there has to be a 99% by yeah. default, yeah. whether that's financially or whatever, whatever it is. But just in terms of like responsibility, yeah, I think most most people, probably sane people, are just happier and more content, <laughs> whether they're the fucking excellent or not or something. More money, just, more problems. <laughs> yeah, just working yeah. in a secure job. And like, I guess if you're an actual entrepreneur, like I am, you are, like people we know are, you, you just you can't really relate to that so, so it right. seems a bit strange but then it's like actually wait a minute oh yeah that is normal I'm just the weird one yeah no that like chooses like, this painful path it's interesting because my so my friend Tim my good friend of mine uh, Tim just moved from France <laughs> to Dubai I think like two th- like this year two months ago now um, and obviously I'm kind of numb to Dubai now like with with like you know the lavish sort of luxuries of it and like yeah. the supercars etc and like the people I meet but to him, it's like a brand new thing because he he went from like zero to like 80K in his bedroom with his parents. And then now for the first time, he's moved like from Paris, from like a small village in like France to like yeah. Dubai. So it's a massive culture shock to him. But uh, this whole like thing about it becoming normal for us, but then you sit down and then, you know, like obviously money's not everything, but like you, the ability to go out and like spend 1K or 2K on a dinner 
and not think twice or to be able to go somewhere and spend, you know, crazy amounts of money on whatever it is, even though, you know, it's stupid, but to be able to have that freedom of doing that, it's a great reward for the stress and the responsibility that does come with the role as well. Yeah. Because uh, there's definitely times where like I have stressful days, I have like anxiety days and I'm not perfect by any means. I'm not just a robot who's like, yes, I'm successful. I'm doing great. Nothing goes wrong in my life, right? Yeah. Like shit goes wrong all the time every other day and there's a lot of stress to do with it but uh in those moments there's been moments where like really stressful shit has happened and you just, i just think like maybe I, a normal secure job would be great right now yeah <laughs> get turned to the dark side yeah yeah i know what you mean or you have a really stressful year and lose and lose loads of money like me which is a fucking lose lose situation but that's another issue but yeah like yeah it, it's I think you just have to be self-aware, which is, I think that's an important conversation to be fair, because like social media has firstly, like obviously, but it's still the case. No one shares any of the downside mm. of anything, whether that's entrepreneurship, fucking any other facet of life, which is a problem. But then it's also like, everyone's pretending they want to be an entrepreneur because it's fucking cooler than ever. Like agency, crypto, econ, whatever it is. I think it's also because of the idea of money as well. If you, if you know what I mean. Like yeah. money, I feel like over the last like few years with like start a business, start an agency, e-commerce, drop shipping, it's all been focused on this goal of make money, right? Make money quick, make yeah. 10K. Like 10K has become like the golden number, right? Yeah. Like make 10K a month. Um, and I think people have forgotten that instead of, like they're chasing the money instead of chasing the goal itself. And, and I feel like definitely with social media promoting it and all these gurus and info products, yeah. it has shifted the mindset of what it means to own an e-commerce brand or a dropshipping brand, right? Because people have now started to chase the bag of money instead of chasing the goal, which is make a successful brand or you know help a brand go from 10K to 100K in a month or 100K to a million in a month. Yeah. Because um, if they do that by default, they'll get the bags of money anyways. Yeah. Right, money is just like an attribute of the goal. And I think, people make money the goal, which is where shit has gone wrong, I feel. Yeah, I also think like pre-social media and like internet and shit, <clears throat> people like got into a career because like that's what they enjoyed and like obviously there's way less options and stuff. Whereas now it feels like every young lad wants to make a load of money so they don't have to work again. Whereas actually yeah. like, your fellas, quick one, you may or may not have noticed there's been a bit of merch, so to speak, in recent episodes. We've got two different things. We've got some of the retro style OG neon beach posters that I designed like four years ago. You may have seen it on my Instagram. And then we've got some of the best selling OG viral style neon signs that basically did start that entire craze about two years ago now. So yeah, if you want to add something to your home office, your living room, just anywhere sick, basically, that you want to add that extra thing to and support the channel, then you can check that out. Link is in the bio, midnight.com co forward slash shop and yeah just an aesthetic item to complement the process i suppose cheers for watching and enjoy the rest of the pod i imagine that most people would get to that position and then realize oh wait yeah what do i do with the rest of my life i should probably do something i enjoy and if i actually just started doing something i enjoy and i'm good at yeah. in the first place granted in a position that can make money like you know econ whatever it is probably not crypto because i feel like that's not really a career um yeah it's more of just like a it's very hot right now but i wouldn't recommend it i don't know we, I, don't, we, I don't know we, enough about crypto. We could, but we could talk about it for sure later on. Yeah. I have a lot to say on that. <laughs> Whereas, like, yeah, I feel like people have, like, stopped talking about the skills and, like, actual interests and things you have to, like, be good at and build to make money. They've just been like, how can I make money so I don't have to do the things to make yeah. money, almost. I feel like the goal is not to not be able to do anything and to retire. The goal should be... To be able to do what you want. Yeah, how can I get to the position where if I wanted to not do anything, I can do that sort of thing yeah you know but also just like it's funny because I, I think I spoke about it before people forget that there is actually a skill set required to do anything mm. to well, a good enough level that actually makes money yeah. whether that's building an econ brand or like running Definitely. an agency people seem more interested in like how, how it looks on their social media but then if you ask them alright cool like, I don't know go and fucking set up this website or yeah. run these ads then they're like oh yeah um, I haven't I don't know I don't know how yeah. to do that shit they just want to look a certain way no, I mean it's, I think it's just that's always going to be how it is isn't it with social media they want the the end goal yeah they don't want the 
the ugly stuff in between. Yeah. You know, the not so sexy stuff. And, and everyone's guilty of it because I was definitely guilty of it when I was a bit younger. But as you get older and experience just more elements of life and like ups and downs in entrepreneurship, I don't know, you just get a more, a clearer perspective on what's bullshit and what's not, yeah. I suppose. And like who's bullshitting and who's not. I think also like uh, failing is a big part of that. You know, like when you failed enough times, that's where most of the experiences come from in my my personal experience. Like I, I, I fuck yeah. up really badly. Oh, okay, I've learned from that now. Fuck up really badly a hundred times. You learn a lot from that. Yeah, right? yeah. You get to a place of like wisdom and then you speak to somebody else about it who mm. hasn't done as much. They're like, how do you know so much? Like I could never get to that level or like I wish I could be at your level. And it's like, well, be prepared to fail a hundred times really badly and go through a lot of stress and have yeah. that responsibility on your shoulders. And then yeah, you probably will be successful. I always say this, like I'm not a genius by any means. Right, I, like, because I started that ebook. I like over a, like, two years ago. I released an ebook on just how to sort of like start an agency, but I wanted to get rid of these like nine nine seven course prices, and I released it for fifteen pounds. Yeah. Right? And I released it, and all these people were saying like, "Oh, you're so amazing!" and da, da, da. And I was like, "No, I'm really not. Like, I'm not a genius by any means. I barely passed school when I did. Like, academically, I'm probably average at best. Yeah. All I did was just try, try, fail a bunch of times, learn from that. Sometimes not learn from it, fail again, learn from it eventually. Yeah. And then, if you do that enough times, you'll be in a better position than you were when you started. But a lot of people just aren't prepared to fail. It's a very scary thing." Yeah. Playing devil's advocate, because I think it's an interesting question. Do you think there's an element of survivorship bias for people that do well and then say, I'm just like you, to the, the masses? Do you know what I mean? Or, oh, as or, in like, just to try appeal? Uh, uh, well, as in like, it's a horrible argument and I don't agree with it because I actually think people that do well, like I think the general argument around survivorship bias, I think it's called, is that people that have done well, in inverted commas, because they got lucky, then tell people that haven't done well, like I worked harder, I, I didn't give up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, when actually they're just the point one percent that things aligned for them at the right time. Oh, right, right. right. Okay. It's quite, it's quite a cynical concept. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Mean. And I think a lot of people on the internet, like trolls and stuff, Promote love that. that. They love it because they're like, I read about. It, I think like Grace Beverly, you know, she runs like Taller and stuff. She's like a big influencer. She's like a, a complete beast. She's like yeah. twenty five. Um, this this girl. Um, and loads of people comment on her shit saying, I've seen it on like YouTube and stuff saying, oh, you went to a private school, you had money to start with. If you hadn't, you wouldn't have done this. You, mm -hmm. you, you just got lucky, et cetera, et cetera. That's classic, like people saying she has survivorship bias. Right, right, right. It's like, in other words, you got lucky. So now you're forgetting that you got lucky and everyone else doesn't have it the same. Got it. I'm making it sound super complicated. No, no I, get, I get what you mean. I get, no, I see. Like, I think it's a really bad way of looking at things and I don't I, agree I with think it. it I think people that do things. well have actually just gone through more generally and have tried harder. Because I've also met people who are like in very fortunate positions when they're like, when they're raised and born like wealthy families yeah. that don't do that well on their own, right? They just sort of rely on it. And then I've met yeah. people who have had that resources that other people don't and have done extremely well with it. You know, like taking like a family business of like, let's say one, two million a year to 500 million, Yeah. right? So they did that. And yes, they might've had the extra resources, but there was still the same level of hard work and failures and sacrifices and lessons and all that to get to that level. Um, I do get pissed off though, when people who genuinely did have a very sort of comfortable lifestyle, but they portray it as if they had the hardest lifestyle in the world Yeah. and they came from nothing and all this stuff. Because I've, I've, I've come across a few of those. Yeah, same. <laughs> like they, they go to private school, they you know, had incredible resources, yeah, we, parents, yeah, Don't money. get me started on that. There's a lot of that around, around where I live, well, yeah. as, as you know. And then they'll, in, come in up, London particularly. <laughs> they'll come up with an info product or a YouTube video and just say like, you know, I came from nothing. I came from like no money. We were starving and all this stuff. And when you look at the facts, it's like they weren't actually that worse off. You know what I mean? Like they were in an okay place. I just respect people a lot more when they just say, look, I, I had a fortunate childhood or I had like yeah. extra access to things that maybe other people didn't. And that's a privilege to some people, but I still did A, B, C, D, E, F, G to get to where I am. Yeah, yeah. You know? People say that about Drake because he and it started from the bottom and he, apparently I think he came from oh, a yeah, middle class he, family. Yeah, yeah. He, he wasn't like the hood and shit, like, like Future and other rappers. But the thing it's is, Drake funny. has never come out and said like, I came from nothing and all yeah, this stuff. Yeah, true. It was just I mean? that one song I think people yeah. said the piss out of started from the bottom, which is not Sit Slapper, obviously, but. Yeah, but it's just, it just depends. Like if the person who's actually 
in the shoes of that story is saying it, it's a different story. If yeah. it's just other people saying that you didn't actually start at the bottom, then it just comes down to like perspective and opinion and you know, yeah, just yeah. people chatting shit and wasting time. Yeah, very true, very true. I want to come on to the econ brand then. So yeah. I knew a little bit, a little bit about this, but what is it? When did you start it? And then I want to ask a lot of different things. So uh, it's called Marble. Um, so we, so basically I came out to Dubai last October and then my girlfriend now had started at the time, she was one of the very few people I knew in Dubai and she had just started a brand called Marble for women and it was like yeah. silk pieces and it was very, very small. It was like literally like selling in the DMs and like posting a yeah, few yeah. pictures. And DM then, to order. And like a lot of people like tell me like, oh, I started a business or I have an e-commerce brand and I don't really, I take it with a grain of salt these days just because I've come across so many e-commerce brands and you know, I kind of know what's a real potential e-commerce brand that can like develop into something great. Yeah. And it's something that's just a bit like in like two months, this is gonna die out sort of thing. Yeah. So um, I don't really take it too seriously, but I remember I asked her to show me her pieces once when I was over at her place and she showed me the, like the clothing and I was blown away. I was like, this is not like, this is not like a $20 product or like yeah. a $10, this could sell for like hundreds. And I saw the potential in it. And I think I even saw the potential in it before she saw the potential in it. And I said that this is gonna be like the next Zara. I literally remember saying that to her. And she didn't believe me. So I was like, look, obviously you know my company does Facebook ads, Instagram ads. What you're doing in the DMs is a bunch of BS, right? This is not how you should be selling yeah, or facts. scaling a brand. So I was like, I'll do it for free. We'll do it for free. You just pay the ad budget, whatever it is, we'll scale you up slowly, right? So we started doing the ads. About a month in, it was at 10X ROAS. And this was probably at about maybe $1,500, $2,000 spend, right? Just in the UAE? In the UAE and Saudi, Yeah. right? And that's when I saw the numbers and I saw the CPMs, the click-through rates, all these figures, I was like, holy shit this area is a gold fucking mine. Yeah. Right, so I invested in the brand immediately, got shares in it. Then the next thing I did was like, I wanna start a men's line. So I was like, I'm gonna start Marble Man. I'm gonna franchise this bitch, right? Yeah. So then like, she already had like the logistics in place, like somewhat, like the delivery was already there, the shipping was already there, the fulfillment, the packaging, the tailors, etc. So I was like, I pretty much already have access to all these resources. I would be stupid with my knowledge not to jump on this and at least try to see what it could do, right? Mm -hmm. And plus, I'm a big, like, I love fashion. Like, yeah. when I see a nice piece of clothing, I really appreciate it. I'm not, like, super into fashion where I'd go to, like, fashion shows or anything, but I appreciate a nice, nice outfit yeah. when I see it. So I was like, it'd be interesting to make my own designs, something minimal, timeless, that can, like, go with anything. And I looked into, like, different angles, and I thought, hey, sustainability is huge right now. The whole recycled brand, you know, recycled fabrics, brand sustainable, eco-friendly. So I was like, I'm gonna jump on that wagon. Um, so sourced the fabrics, finalized some designs after like six or seven attempts. Originally, I just honestly made it for myself. I, yeah. I just thought I'd test it out. Just shirts um, to start with or what? It was just shirts we started with. Like yeah. I started off with like silk shirts and then linen shirts. And yeah. then I started going to a lot of house parties because I was new to Dubai. Mm. So I was like meeting new people, networking. And almost every time I wore these shirts, I would always get compliments of, oh, where did you get that? Yeah. Right? And he was like, oh, is that like Zara? Is that Balmain? Is that this? And I was like, no, it's mine. And they're like, what? No way, you have to make me a few, right? I'll come by, take my measurements, make me a few. And I was like, N I see BA to do that. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not gonna take your measurements, make your shirt, right? Fuck off. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what I just did was like, all right, it's time to actually make some stock and test this out in the market. So I made about like three designs in linen, two designs in silk. And I was like, let me try this. And I started it off with like almost nothing, maybe like 3K spend a month or like 4K spend a month, um, just to see what it would do. Yeah. First month, eight extra ass, sold out. Mad. Right? So I was like, holy fuck. Right, let's do this again. So I did it again, again. Seven, eight extra ass, sold out pretty much. I had to keep ordering more production. Then I was like, okay, we need to really make this a brand. So this was like towards the say like February now of this year. Yeah. And I started like, you know, up in production, making the logistics better on the back end, delivery, bringing down the bottom line costs as much as possible to make it a really profitable business. Uh, and then from there, just new stock, customers started coming in, the ads started to perform better, uh, both for women and men. And from there we started scaling up and then 
about three months ago, uh, one of the head acquisition team members from Dubai Mall here in Dubai contacted us through DMs and they said, we found you guys through an ad. We really like you. We want to start introducing more like UAE handmade local brands into Dubai Mall yeah. as like a test experiment for the next six months. Do you want to be part of that? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, th that's that's pretty much how it's gone from start to finish. It's scaled really quickly. Still haven't expected it to scale this quickly, um, but it's just one of those like blessings, I guess. Yeah, that's happened. Oh, so many questions. So, so to start with, then is Marble that your girlfriend started? Is that a separate company now to the Marble Man's thing? Yeah. Are you so you're not co-owners on both of them? No. no. So Marble Man is like 100% mine. Marble Women is like hers. Like yeah. she's the owner, and then I, I, I part own it. Yeah, and then where's everything made? Here, all in, in the UAE, all in Dubai. Oh, well, literally in Dubai. Yeah, okay, which is great because for lead times, it's yeah. like it's like that. Like I said, like the samples that just came in when you walked in. Yeah, like that was made like this morning, and then they just sent it to me to look at, and then I just look at it, test it out, you know, wear yeah, it a few times. That's interesting. And it's all you only sell in the UAE. And Saudi, and, and, Saudi. and GCC countries but like Qatar, Kuwait, but not outside that at all. We can still do worldwide shipping. Like we've had like orders every now and then coming through random places. I don't know how. So you do ship there, you just don't advertise there. Yeah, we just don't advertise there because I want to really dominate this market. Yeah. Um, like we had like an order from US somehow. We had one from the UK, one from like Geneva, and it's, it's just random places. I don't know how they found us. But like, I'm gonna have to have a look after this because. Yeah, there's a lot of talk over the past few years of like obviously ad costs in like tier one countries like UK, US, whatever, Europe are getting super expensive, which they fucking are. Yeah. And then I've heard of people like starting brands that are aimed at like maybe Germany specifically, which is like obviously a bit more like out of the usual. Mm -hmm. But then I've never heard of people doing like UAE. I don't know if that's because I just don't know anyone. Neither did really. I, to be fair. Neither did I. But do, but do you think now, that's helped like the RAS and stuff because it's just way less competition? Thousand percent, man. Like running like, I don't think ads. Of any brands that run ads here. Or at least not specifically there's, here. The thing is though, like it's really shocking because there's a lot of brands who run ads here, but they do them really poorly. But I think they continue to do them poorly but just because the ROAS that they get justifies it. Yeah. So they're just comfortable with really bad ads because they're just making their profit or their, you know, their break even or whatever it is. So um, it's a really interesting market. Like the way I see it, it's like e-commerce just hasn't boomed here yet, right? So yeah, like, you, you, like one of the most common questions we get is, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, where's your store? That is a really common question that we yeah, get. Yeah. And, I, and I have to be like, oh, we, you know, we're not, we don't have a store yet. We're only online. We're opening in Dubai more soon. And then people are like, oh, okay. Right. And then like, that's about like 50%. So 50% are just okay ordering online, but the majority are still, where's your store? I want to come in. I want to try it on. And then what I see that is it, it's like 2015, 2016 UK where yeah, it was yeah. before the online craze, before the retails had sort of plummeted down. And I think that's where like Saudi, UAE, GCC countries like Qatar, Kuwait are at right now. And my goal is I want to be the brand that's generating like 10 mil rev a year. So then when that boom to online does happen, and then that other 50 or 60% now switches to online and they don't, you know, second guess it or double take yeah. ordering online. I want to be part of that boom that takes me from 10 mil to like, 100 mil and do you think you can do that just in the UAE I think so I think you could because yeah. I think I think that there's there's brands that are like above us that have done it in the last two years they've scaled to like ridiculous numbers and like company evaluations and revenues yeah yeah and like I said right I'm a person who's always been if it's already done there's no reason why I can't do it so yeah that's interesting actually because I've always just thought start in the UK US yeah. Like probably everyone else. Because I, I, I've debated UK. starting an e-commerce brand multiple times over the last like two years, just because like I'm in the e-commerce ads, I yeah. know how to do them well. So I've always thought like, hey, why don't I just have my own brand? Um, and I had my own little like drop shipping stuff that I was doing, which was like okay, but there was nothing that I was really passionate about. And I feel like when you have a brand like that's yours, you have to be like obsessed with it. Right. Oh yeah. You have to be, otherwise it's not really going to get to the level that you, you want it to. So when this, like the synergy is just kind of aligned, yeah. right? Like I never planned to start the brand. I just came here, starting helping out my girlfriend. Yeah, and then it's an interesting story. The rest happened. Are the ads in English then or are they in local language and shit? Both. Or is it a mix? Both, yeah. Both. So like we run like Arabic ads and then we run <clears throat> Arabic, English yeah. ads. I forgot what Arabic is called then. Um, um. But the English ones actually perform better, surprisingly. 
Because can, everyone can speak English here, generally. Yeah, yeah, everyone. Like, generally. Like, yeah, everyone, yeah. Yeah, fuck, that's cool. When would you start running out outside of here? Or do you reckon just focus on here? Or, or, or is that ever a plan? Or do you reckon just focus no, on here? No, definitely is planned. Definitely is planned. Um, but I'm not sure when, man. Can't answer that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense to focus on one. Like, region, I really want to. If it's working as well. I want to milk as much as possible in the UAE, in Saudi, in Kuwait, in Qatar, all these like countries that surround us now. Once that's really been like dominated, where like, you know, everybody knows our name on the streets or, you know, I see like, I don't, there's like, there's one brand that I like, I'm pretty much like basing my model off now in terms of scaling. And like, I probably see like a person wearing their piece of clothing like two times, three times a week when I'm yeah. out, like in the malls and restaurants, etc. Once I get to that level, that's when I'll start thinking of like, okay, should we start now focusing on other regions? Yeah, so saturate, then expand. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. You have quite an interesting perspective then because you have done the agency stuff, then had a brand. Like, oh. I haven't come across anyone else. I mean, I'm sure there are a few, but how do you think the two models compare as a business owner, generally speaking, broadly? And then I want to dive into some specifics. So it's like what I was saying earlier. Like I feel like the agency teaches you like a really big skill set, like a really big range of skill sets. So it almost makes you like the jack of all trades. Yeah. That is if you get into the agency and you decide to sort of really meticulously learn different verticals of the agency. There are some people I know that just get into the agency model and they just outsource everything. So they don't really learn like, you know, different verticals of it. But then at the same time, those agencies, in my opinion, don't tend to scale to like the biggest levels. Like the biggest agencies in the world aren't run by people that have just outsourced everything. Yeah, you know they're run by people who know every role inside and out meticulously with such detail that if shit went wrong, they could replace it temporarily if they needed to, sort of thing. So I feel like the agency gives you that. With e-commerce, it's like a different. Like I see e-commerce as a lot of fun. Right, like e-commerce is really fun to me. Like you, you, you wake up, you have like orders coming in. You've made, you know what your profits are from it. You've yeah. made money, and you're like, oh, I've made money while sleeping, sort of thing, right? And it's more passive, and it's more. It gives you that more sort of reward aspect. I feel like they're way more scalable e-commerce brands because yeah, you can exit agreed. for crazy, crazy prices. Agencies, yes, you can scale them, but can you sell them off? Can you exit? Not really, right? Yeah, I was going to ask that. You what know, your view on that is. You know, you can't, I mean, I know a few people who have sold their agencies. I've always wondered how you would, because my outside view is, well, but where's the, where's the brand? There's no brand value, because also yeah. the, the business yeah. is the deck of clients and the clients can cancel. Exactly. So I, I don't know, like I know one person who has sold his agency for I think like a mil, or like 1.5 mil yeah. USD. But I think that the person who bought it off him was just buying it for more of the relationships with the brands rather than the agency aspect of it itself. Yeah. Right, because an agency can like evolve like so many times throughout a year in terms of its clientele basis, in terms of its team, in terms of the, re the you know, the services that they deliver. But I guess if you have like really big clients on board or big names and you have good relationships with them, maybe yeah. that's what's worth buying I can, I can see, Yeah, I can see where the value would be, but less so compared yeah, to the Yeah, me too, me too. Like I don't really see myself selling off the agency. I, my goal with the agency is to, to become the best agency in the world, right? Like I wanna get to the position where in like three, four years time, or like by the time I hit 30, I wanna be in a position where, you know, brands, like big, big name brands look at me when they think of marketing. That's where I wanna position myself yeah. in like the next five years. So that's my goal with the agency. And I don't really see myself exiting from that. If anything, I see myself exiting from the CEO position, passing it on to my sister, yeah. and then who knows, maybe she'll hire a CEO full time or whatever it is, but the agency will still be mine. I'll still be getting the cash flow from it. Um, and like the networks it opens up is pretty interesting as well. So you meet some really good business owners and you get, you know, you can leverage that in terms of other aspects of life with e-commerce. Or let's say if I decided to start a new brand tomorrow, I have a lot of clients with a lot of capital that probably would invest if I asked them to. Yeah. Right. If I presented them the right model and it made sense for them, they probably would. Yeah. So I'd have like that network to leverage as well. Um, but with, what was the question again? <laughs> I guess it was kind of broad, wasn't it? How do they compare? 
Yeah, and then like, so with the e-commerce side of things, I just see it more of as like a much more scalable thing, much more fun thing. Um, but at the same time, it also teaches you a lot more about the, I think an e-commerce brand has definitely taught me more about the finances of a brand Yeah. versus the agency, because you don't really have to focus on that as much. You know, like with profit margins, yeah. gross profit. That's the point I was going to make, to be fair. And, and that, another question off the back of that, but like, I've, ex- I've found it frustrating sometimes in the past where I feel like agencies, because they're obviously serving brands and you're the brand client, I'm the brand client, but because they don't have their own brand, they don't, it's almost like they don't really understand because like agencies, you know, obviously like you have, have affected the team costs, which is the overhead, but then it's other than that, it's profit. Like mm-hmm. there's no cost of goods. Yeah. There's no lead time. There's less cash flow challenges, generally speaking. There's less scale of customer service. Granted, there's clients, but there's not thousands or tens of thousands, a hundred thousands of customers. There's no social media reputation in the same way that needs to be managed. Yeah. So yeah, I, I find it frustrating sometimes where agen- it feels like agencies don't understand that because ultimately they're just getting the fee. So has running the brand made you a better agency only do you think because you understand elements of what clients are dealing with more in a physical product business I think def I mean I always tried to consider it anyways in the past even before the the brand was sort of started Um, but I think it's given me a more fresh pair of lenses like on it because uh, I understand that like you know if we make them like a 5x ROAS that 5x isn't really 5x exactly you know that's what I mean because they've got the you know, the goods, retainer, team, then they've overhead. got the whatever percentage profit that they <clears> actually make from the product, yeah. the delivery, the sh- fulfillment, their team, other aspects of their business and costs, maybe upfront stock delivery. Yeah. So their ROAS might differ from month to month, right? It might like one month might be like a two x real time, another month might be one point eight, another month might be three point five. Mm. Even on the front end of ads, you're doing well. So it definitely like gets me like thinking about it a lot more. But at the same time, I feel like I've always like separated it well enough in terms of expectations. And I do say this to clients when I sign them on board, like my responsibility is make sure that your paid marketing works and it's super yeah. profitable for you. Your responsibility is make sure that you have your shit and shit right on the back end so that if we do scale and if we do really well, you're not gonna come to me and say, we need to scale down or this or that or that. Yeah. And as long as I have that expectation set out clearly and they understand it, we tend to have great relationships. Yeah, yeah, I agree. If you had to pick one mm. right now that you could keep running, which one would it be? Oh, oh. <laughs> and like, obviously there's factors that influence everything, but gut decision, you have to sack off one and focus on one. Which one would it be? And I know Ag- there's pros and cons. Agency. You keep the agency. I keep the agency. Because I feel like with the e-com brand, <clears throat> as I said, even though it's more scalable, financially and then you can exit for a bigger payout I just I just love the agency side of it as well man I, I would say I love it more it's close it's close but I love it more like I love my team too much it is like my first baby essentially right I've built it from scratch to where it is now it's a well-oiled machine but I like I like it being there in terms of a scaling in terms of the growth in terms of like the goals that I have for it as well over the next five years. Like I see it being more of like the rewarding work. Yeah. You know, with like with the e-commerce agency, it's almost felt like play. It hasn't really felt like- The e-com brand. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, the e-commerce brand, yeah. Did yeah. I say e-commerce agency? Yeah, yeah sorry, with the e-commerce brand, it's almost felt like play. Like it's just felt like, you know, we have everything in place on the back end. We launch ads, we make money sort of thing. And like, you know, then we get repeat buyers and then we have good reviews, etc. And that's sort of it there's not been really like a rewarding thing from it. Like me having an extra 20K or 30K a month in income doesn't give me anything of value to my life. Yeah. But me having clients that are super fulfilled, that are happy with us, that refer us, that grow their own things and like, you know, change their own lives on the back end, that gives me way more fulfillment than the e-commerce brand does. Yeah, interesting. Because I've sometimes looked at agencies and thought, fuck, that that seems like le- less stressful in ways. I'm sure there's obviously ways it's more stressful. Like it's better cash flow. Cause yeah, like you said, the way I look at an econ brand is ultimately, 
and people need to realise this from the outside looking in as well. Like you can have an econ brand, and I've said it before, but like you can have a, you can have an econ brand making a million pound profit a year, which is fucking hard, by the way. Like zero point zero one percent of brands probably doing that. Yeah. But even then, as a founder, you're probably not really seeing it, realizing any of that value because if you want to grow it properly, you're Growing reinvesting all of it into stock, <laughs> team, ads, etc. So like, really, like the big potential win with the brand is is an exit, like you said, and and even that, you know, most brands probably never get there. Yeah. You know, it either goes wrong beforehand, like, like one of my brands, or <laughs> or you just you know it fizzles out, you lose momentum, etc. But yeah. Yeah, for me, I've always just building that brand because I've had like 10 brands over the years, which is my problem. I've, oh, like, wow. I've chopped and changed. Like, like, when I say 10, I mean like, I'm including like every little fucking little thing oh, I did okay, when okay. I was 18, but probably four brands that were seven figures in revenue. Three. Uh, and then, yeah, my, my problem is not sticking to one thing long enough. Mm. But now it's like the, the next thing I'm like, look, I'm doing one thing, one brand, fucking pick one. And just do it really well. Because, yeah, like... I'm not going to get to that 100 million exit doing something for 18 months. It's just not going to happen. It's got to be probably five years. Yeah. Five definitely. years plus, at least. Five, yeah, I agree. I agree. But I think within five years, you can definitely do that with, with, with the right brand in the right market at the right time. I agree. Timing is everything as well. And then, of course, what the market can actually give give you back out of it. But, um, yeah, it's interesting, man. Like, I love the e-commerce brand. I love that it's growing, it's scaling, it's exciting, it's new for me. But if I had to choose, I, would, I think I'd pick the agency. Because I feel like it just gives me more fulfillment, you know? Yeah. Like, there's, like it's, 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 it's fun. Like, it, yes, it's more stressful in terms of the service delivery. You're dealing with people, so it's yeah. way more stressful. Uh, while it's with the brand, yes, you are dealing with people, but, like, you, you know, you get there's customers. There's more smaller customers. Yeah, yeah, it's, like, customers, and their issues are relatively smaller yeah. than, like, what clients can be. Um, but when shit does go right and you, you get that momentum and, you know, communication is clear, the direction is clear, there's no, like, silly objections or, like, silly obstacles in the way, then uh, it can be, like, a life-changing thing for, for, like, the actual client, you know? Like, I've had clients that have, like, messaged me and said, you know, because of you, I was able to pay off, like, my three daughters' tuition fees for university and, like get a new house and like start a new business and all this and that, that just like hearing that is a beautiful thing the fact that I had somehow had an impact in paying off their daughters like university fees for life all three done they get a new house done the family's happy secure they don't how much stress. is that client spending it must be pretty big they spend a lot yeah. yeah they spend like I think like 200k a month something like that yeah so they, they spend a lot but it's just that side of the business is like like no one's gonna message me with with the brand and say like your shirt changed my life. <laughs> right? Well, you'd be, yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, like, I mean, we've had like good reviews, but no yeah, one's yeah. gonna be like, you know, I changed my life. Yeah, I decided I to mean. start a business, and like I made millions from it just because I saw your shirt, sort of thing. It's very, very unlikely. But with the agency, the work that we do, it's like directly impacting, you know, not just the clients' lives, but they have teams that they support. The teams grow, the teams get better off, etc. So, it's uh, yeah. If I had to pick one, I'd pick that. Yeah, yeah, cool. So, c- coming away from the business specific side of things for a minute, because I think a lot of people will look at you, as with other people, but you in this case, and think, young guy, two businesses. It looks fucking great, um, and and. A lot of it is. What has been the hardest part of going from, of of developing from, you know, an eighteen-year-old civilian, (laughs) as we all start, (laughs) and I I use that term all the time. Some people fucking hate it, but it's funny. No, I like it. To where you are now, like aside from business challenges, like you know, mental, emotional, social challenges, relationship challenges. I think I think the biggest thing was like getting to a point where I stopped giving into like peer pressure and like the the norms of society that was definitely a big thing especially when I started in uni when I decided to start the agency it was like a polar opposite to what people are doing in uni yeah like they're just partying freshers drinking every weekend living for the weekend sort of thing and when you switch because I lived that lifestyle switching from that 
to let's stay in, let's work until 1 a.m., let's plan this. Drinking at 4 p.m. Right, let's, yeah, well, I mean, now, now we can do that, yeah. right? I couldn't do that before. Yeah. But it's like uh, switching to that and then seeing all the, you know, quote unquote friends sort of like disappear or judge or look yeah. down on you. That definitely was a, a tough part in the beginning because I realized entrepreneurship is, and I stand by this, I think entrepreneurship when you first begin is definitely a very lonely journey. Yeah, fuck yeah, it is. Because it's very hard to find people, especially early on before you've really matured, before you've found the right circles and you know, you've developed yourself, to have a, friends around you or a circle around you that understands it or gets it or can really relate to it when you talk about your problems or your stresses. Yes, you can tell family, but it, it's never gonna be to the same extent that if I'm talking with like another e-commerce owner or another yeah. agency owner, they're not really gonna understand the intricacies of the problems or the weight that they carry. So one was sort of getting over that, I accept that this journey is gonna be lonely and I need to push through because there's a better, there's a light at the end of this tunnel. Yeah. Uh, the second thing was money for me, man. Like the importance of money used to be huge in my mind. Like it was the end of all things. Like. I need money, I need money in my bank account. I have to save, I have to hold on to it. Um, and I think a lot of that stemmed from my parents, just cause as I was growing up, when we moved here, it was, you know, my parents were working like two, three jobs each. It was very rough for them in terms of raising me. I was home alone from like the ages of like six, taking care of my two year old sister. And my parents would just be at work all day. But I'm grateful for that because it, it matured me a lot, I feel, having, that extra responsibility. But anyways, going back to that, like they had this perspective of money, of we need to hold on to it, we need to save it, we can't invest it, you know, just don't do stupid shit with money. And like I, that definitely gets instilled on you as yeah. you're growing up. So when I started making money, even though looking back now, it's like small subs of money, but for some people it's big, like having 1K or 2K extra, right? Like that was like precious. Like that was like, you need to save that. I need to, you know, make this 1K last six months somehow. Yeah. Or stuff like that. Like don't spend here, don't spend there. And slowly as I started making more and more, I definitely hit this plateau. And I think that plateau came for me around like 20-ish K a month where I knew that to grow, I had to spend money. Yeah. But it was very difficult for me to get over that programming of spending is okay and money will come even if I spend a lot of it now. Like money will always come. To get into that mindset of uh, um, let go and it will come back sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, but I remember reading this book called Re Reality Transurfing and uh, they made a great example of like, what's the difference between like a homeless man and then a person who has a good job and you give him $10,000 and you say, go into Louis Vuitton right now and buy that $10,000 $10, bag. Right, the person who's probably got a great job and he's doing okay, he's gonna go in, he's just gonna buy the bag, he's not gonna think twice. The person who's homeless is gonna think a million times of, but this $10,000, I could spend it over here and I could save it and I don't need to spend it on a bag and all this and stuff. And they would second doubt themselves a thousand times over until they actually did the decision. Um, and the, I remember reading that part of the book, I don't remember which chapter it was, but it hit me hard of, uh, I need to get out of this, like, like, I said this quote to Tyler the other night, actually. If it's not normal to you, it's not gonna be yours, right? Yeah. And th that hit me hard at the time because I realized if I want this lifestyle where, you know, a Louis Vuitton handbag is like an everyday thing, I need to get into that mind frame where it is an everyday thing. It's normal, right? Spending yeah. 5K on that bag, it's gonna be normal for me. Getting, driving nice cars is gonna be normal for me. It's yeah. like driving a Toyota Corolla, right? I had to get into that mindset and I think it took me a long time to like really condition myself to get out of this whole hoard money mind frame and get into this state of abundance where I know that you know money comes like this, it goes up, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down, but it's always gonna be there. And uh, that was one of the biggest challenges for me. I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, th th that's a good quote. I like that. It, if it's not normal to me, it, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I still think tank and fucking LV handbags bullshit, but yeah. I, I, I agree. I agree no, I agree. Point. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm just using uh, the LV yeah, handbag yeah. as like what the book was stating. Yeah, yeah. Um, I still think spending 10K on an LV handbag is ridiculous. And yeah. they're not even that great, by the way, guys. You should spend it on my brand instead. <laughs> but, yeah, I'll spend it on your brand before that. It's but, just my style. but it's like, um, just getting into that mind frame of like, you know, it's okay to invest another 2K on an employee that's gonna save yeah. you so much more time or it's okay to sometimes <clears throat> splash out on a nice dinner that you can pay for and you have the means to do it. You don't need to feel guilty for doing it sort of thing. Cause there was a lot of times where I'd spend money and even though I knew I, I could spend it and I'd be okay if I spent it, I'd feel like shit for spending it. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know? And I, it's, it's just to ruin the fun of it for me. Yeah. I think the one thing I've realized, particularly in the past year, and I've said it before, and it's but yeah, because I lost a bit of money and blah, 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 whatever. But like, yeah, money comes and goes. Like, but the, the one thing, if you're smart and you're not a fucking cunt, you can't lose your experience. You can't lose your network. You can't Sounds lose, like you can't lose the things that you fucking know that 99% of people don't know that haven't bothered going to war in a certain area. Do you know what I mean? So. I agree. And I, I think network particularly, and yeah, like I was speaking to Tyler again about this the other day. It's like, I sometimes think, Jesus Christ, like I reckon I've lucky enough to have one of the best networks probably in, in the fucking country, in the UK for my age. Mm. And just in terms of like the quality of people around me, not only they're all doing similar things and we're on the same page, but they're also just good guys and, and girls in some cases, but mainly guys. So yeah, I, th- I think that's, that's super important. I think and so too. I think I definitely slept on network for a while as well. Yeah, I think a lot of people do. And I've had guests on, which I disagree with, and, and they definitely are sleeping on network. Like they're living at home because yeah. they think that networking is a distraction. Like networking is just the yeah. basic human interaction I that agree. we are biologically wired yeah. for. Like for, network for, just makes it sound like some fucking yeah, woo woo work. For, for a while, I thought that networking was this thing like you have to go people. to like an event and you need to mingle with people yeah. and transactional like, you know, conversations. But especially like, like moving to Dubai I think was the best decision I made in the last like five years yeah I think genuinely moving here expanded my networks like 10x and like I'm proud to say that now I have the kind of friendships and the kind of value and the like-minded people around me that if I ever did need help for whatever reason I know I'd be okay because yeah, I have exactly. yeah, the same. best people around me to get me through the hardest of times you know um, and I think like to be able to say that is a, a rarity in today's society because there's a lot of people out there and I'm sure like even maybe some people listening to this who will think like if shit really did come down to it and I hit rock bottom would my friends help me out and I think a lot of people and I definitely used to be in the position where the answer probably would be no yeah right now I feel like if shit did hit rock bottom I'm very confident with my experience and the network that I have I'd bounce back faster than I've ever grown that's kind of where I've been the past few months yeah yeah that's an amazing place it's, it's a really like b- blessful place to be in I would say you know yeah because yeah if, if you have good people you basically can't lose I think yeah that's kind of the way I look at it I agree I agree as long as you're a fucking smart smart don as well and like got, got something there which if you're doing something right you will another part then um, we were speaking about off camera and I've, I've spoke about it in a few episodes. I, f- I think it's quite relevant. Maybe I'm just like pining about it myself recently. <laughs> like r- relationships and like girls and shit. I knew they were going to say this. Well, yeah, it's probably just, this is a therapy session for me. I might have to fucking fill up this wine. One sec, let's just pause it. Right, yeah, relationships. As I was saying, we had another little quick break there. Um, I, I don't know why I feel the need to keep speaking about this in, in recent episodes. Maybe it's because I went through a breakup four weeks ago and I'm very much not over it. And last night I drank too much on at Five Palm which is a strange location, by the way. I think every single girl is a hooker by default. I don't think you can get in otherwise. Um, and, and I nearly text my ex. By but default. Because I, I deleted her number, so I can't text her. Yeah, I know what you were saying. Which is definitely a good move. Because I would have felt like a little simp if I'd done so. No contact rule. No contact, yeah. Um, Got to follow it. You know, actually, after my bad breakup, I bought a course on how to get back with your ex. How to get back with your ex? I bought a course on how to... Because she broke up with me and it completely blindsided me. And it was how to get back with your ex, and I spent like nine hundred quid on it. Fuck me, and, did it uh, work? Like, 
the course I think taught me more on how to just be a man rather than anything else rather than how to actually get her back because I learned that you should just be okay either way like if your goal is to try to get them back you're probably not going to succeed yeah if your goal is to try to be the best version of yourself as a byproduct you'll probably get them back anyways all things granted if shit doesn't go wrong and there's like not unforeseen circumstances and like you had a healthy relationship yeah pri- previously if it's toxic then yeah it probably won't happen anyways toxic yeah but um yeah I, I, just, I just remember man like I would definitely say like that bad breakup that I told you about off camera was one of the key motivators for me really succeeding with the agency in that first year because it happened during like literally like two months after I had started it and I think that really pushed me to get on the routine, the discipline, the 50 cold calls a day, waking yeah. up at 5 a.m., going gym, da, 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 all of that would not probably have happened if I was in a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, because technically, like, uh, I instigated my breakup, but ultimately, she technically was the one that said... Right, I'm breaking up with you, and that kind of pissed me off. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake! But I don't th- I don't we were living together, and I basically it. kicked her out. Well, I didn't view it as kicking her out at the time, but I basically said, I think we should try not living together. And then, kind of looking back now, yeah, I basically kicked her out, which was a bad move. As in, my mate moved in, and she didn't really know what was going on. But she, I don't know. It all happened so fast. Maybe <laughs> it was for the best. Um, I think in many ways it was, but. Yeah, it kind of pissed me off that she had the last say and was like, right, I'm breaking up with you. And I was That's like, oh. just ego though, isn't it? That, well, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is, yeah. And I think she was upset more at first and I wasn't. And then I got upset in hindsight. I think that always happens. And I was like, fuck. And I, I, I'm still like having flashes of it where I'm like, oh, fuck's sake. But I mean, even though I know I've never struggled with girls, I don't struggle with girls. That's not a problem. But it's just like other girls aren't her do you know what I mean obviously it's fucking gay yeah. as that sounds that's deep but like she's probably gonna watch this <laughs> and I, I don't think she will watch it oh, okay. I don't think she watches anything I put out I mean maybe now maybe now well it, maybe, maybe she well fuck it maybe she's watching yeah I'll just be as honest as possible but yeah now I'm thinking oh, I don't know maybe it could have I, I, I don't know I don't know maybe, I'm just a fucking romantic cunt like yeah. I, I don't subscribe to the whole like, oh, I want to be a baller and like just hate women and not hate women but like like not show emotion and stuff like look down on if them if you have feelings for a girl like just it's fucking natural and, like, I think it's a it's a can be a creative like it can push you to be more creative and stuff and I don't know I, I've always just been very in touch with my romance. emotions and like yeah. romance and shit I mean I th- it's, it comes down to like that feminine energy of guy right because the masculine energy is the whole you know, tough, macho, yeah. responsible. But then the feminine energy is also like showing love, showing your emotions, being able to sympathize and compassion and all that stuff. I feel like a lot of guys are out of tune of their, with their feminine side, which lets them yeah, down agreed. a lot in, with a lot of relationships. But um, I think it's natural, man. Like, I think, I, I agree with you. Like, I think that if you find the right girl and you have a healthy balance and they support you, you support them, you communicate clearly. You, you And like, I think one of the most beautiful things is to grow together, right? And it doesn't have to be with a person, like a, a romantic partner. It could even be with like a best friend. Yeah. Like I think just growing together is like, it's almost like our innate human behavior. Like if you look at how we survived through evolution, it was like through tribes and communities, right? And people like grew together and thrived together or they would die together. Yeah. You know, or they die alone, which is even more miserable. <laughs> but um, I think it's just that natural aspect. I think that's one of the most beautiful things, like growing with somebody in one way or another. Yeah. It doesn't have to be business. It could be growing emotionally. It could be finding love together. It could be starting a new adventure together or, you know, learning how to, I don't know, dealing with anger issues together or whatever it is. Like there's so many verticals of it. But um yeah, I don't even I don't even know where I was going with that. But yeah, no, it's just I, yeah, it's I, I like think it's some just a good point, good, good co- point to make. Language. <laughs> yeah, so do, do you have a girlfriend now, though. One which year, which obviously now, yeah. mentioned already, anyway, yeah. because of the the brand. Yeah. How did that come about? Firstly, and do you <laughs> think? Well, maybe you can't speak about it, but how did that come about? And secondly, 
do you think that is a net benefit a net benefit now i feel like you have to say it is but like yeah no i do what I are the pros and cons because a lot of entrepreneurs i feel like stereotypically are like oh i can't have a girlfriend until i'm retired mm -hmm. all those bollocks which i don't necessarily agree with so but i want your views on it my my dad from a very young age he repeated this a lot and i don't think i really understood it until maybe i hit my first or second year in business, but he always used to say everything in moderation. And I think that's like, that stands for a lot of my lifestyle today. I think like having a girlfriend, being in love, spending time with somebody, putting energy into something or somebody, you should always do it with moderation. Cause I think like there's situations where when you don't, it can go very wrong. Like for example, you go head over heels with somebody, right? And you lose yourself in the process. Yeah. That's very dangerous. I feel like that kind of happened to me. And I, it's to happened extent. to me as well. Like I definitely was there with my previous relationships. Um, and the whole like net, but I think, yeah, definitely. But like net work, like net benefit, gross profit margin of my girlfriend <laughs> yeah. has been very positive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but so I met her two years ago in Bali. I went there with my best friend at the time. And we basically met a group of girls out there, like seven or eight of them. My girlfriend, my now girlfriend was one of them, but I actually dated another girl in that group at the time. Oh really? After Her Bali. Friend. Like they're sort of friends, yeah. That's funny. Like they, like Is that acceptable? Mutual friends, I would say. Not yeah. like close friends. So it's acceptable, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I dated her for like three months or like four months. And then we broke up. And then after that relationship, I like, I, I had time to like really reflect on what I wanted versus what I didn't want. And I had this period going into like COVID-19 as well, where I just dated a lot. And I went, you know, week on week, new date, new girl, new date, new girl. And I met all kinds of women. I met really beautiful women with really shallow, like shitty personalities. I met beautiful women who were incredibly smart. I met, you know, average looking women who had like the funniest personalities or, you know, I just met, I made a lot of friends throughout that period. Yeah. and. Uh, it really showed me the different types of women out there, how to communicate with them. It taught me a lot about my masculine energy as well, like the whole uh, attraction aspect, how to attract a woman, what qualities I wanted to stand for as a man, like what kind of man I wanted to be as well, right? Did I want to be like a fuck boy who was flexing to try to get women or yeah. did I want to be a man that genuinely could be understanding and listen to women and then they by default would be attracted to me and want me right for those reasons rather than just like what watch i'm wearing or mm. like how much i'm paying for dinner or whatever it is um so at that time like it really definitely was a like experimental i would say like period where i saw many different people different varieties and ranges of women from different parts of their lives some younger some a bit older from different parts of the world different cultures and it made me so confident in what I wanted versus what I didn't want. Like I really felt like after all of that, I knew exactly what it is that was good for me and what exactly would not be beneficial to me yeah. in a relationship. And uh, when I moved to Dubai, my girlfriend, like my now girlfriend was living here already for the last like two years. Um, and she was with a few other girls that I'd met from Dubai. So I just hit them up and I was like, I'm moving to Dubai, show me around. And then came here. Show, they showed me around, etc. Start connecting with my girlfriend more and more, and then things just happened sort of very effortlessly and naturally. Which she uh, came around, saw the sixty fourth floor, three and a half thousand square foot flat. <laughs> no, but, no, it wasn't no, even that. That's very good. It was. Uh, I wasn't even living here at the time. I was living with Adrian back in uh, a different building, and um, yeah, I don't know. Just things very. They just happened. Like that was the thing. Like she was actually dating somebody when I moved here. Yeah. And I remember at one of the house parties, she seemed upset. And I kept saying like, you know, tell your boyfriend to come around. He's invited as well for the house party. They were just having some issues. And then it was like at 1 a.m. Like people were starting to like slowly leave the house party. Like the peak of it had died down. Yeah. And then um, I remember just like talking to her for like 20 or 30 minutes, just giving her like some sort of drunk advice on like what Always I good. had learned from relationships. I, I had no intentions. The crazy thing is I never had intentions of getting with her, which is like the first time. That's probably the most organic in a way. Yeah. 
Like, like it was the first time in my life where I was very comfortable being alone. Like moving to Dubai, I was in a very good mental space where I didn't feel the need to try date girls or go on Tinder or like yeah. try find somebody for the weekend. Like I was just okay living my best life, right? And it took me a while to get to that place and I was like, I was just content like with my life, right? So when I started like talking to her, we just started having these very in-depth sort of heart to heart conversations. And I never, in the back of my mind, I was never thinking, what's my ulterior agenda here, right? It was just purely just, I'm having a conversation for the sake of having a good conversation. Yeah. And um, one thing led to another, we just got more and more closer. And then she ended up like not dating that guy anymore. And then we just were friends for a while and then things just naturally happened. So yeah, it's just, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. Like I, I can say like I'm in the healthiest relationship I have been in. Like she really motivates me to wake up for the next day and do better and be a better version of myself. Yeah. And yes, we've like, I've had like, you know, every couple has arguments and like squabbles and all that. But it's the first time that no matter what, I know that we both have the capacity and maturity to communicate with each other if we don't like something or if there's an issue that we'll be fine regardless. And I feel like there's just this huge level of respect for each other, which I don't think I ever experienced in previous relationships, which made me realize that this was the relationship I wanted to be in rather than getting into a relationship because you just sort of like, you know, craved a bit of yeah. more attention or yeah. you wanted more companionship or you wanted to fulfill like a different void in your life sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like with my ex, well, this is going out like two months after we broke up probably, but recording like a month. Um, yeah, it happened very naturally and shit. Um, but yeah, I, I reckon there was an element of, maybe it was a bit too like, went too quick and I like, probably like lost myself in the romance a little bit. Mm which I don't think is that much of a problem at the end of the day but she also met me at like a large chunk of our relationship was me going through this most stressful year of my entire life which I don't think fucking helped and now I'm like literally since we broke up like a lot of that has like finalised mm -hmm. um, in many ways and that, that's kind of annoying so I think oh fuck did that have a negative effect on the way that maybe I made her feel and shit and it's kind of annoying because like she was like, oh you're always so stressed and shit and we were, like, spoke about it and I was like oh fuck well that's only temporary but I feel but like it's, it's maybe a, it's fucked a the relationship it's a lesson you know so if she's watching then I don't know I feel like things are different now but <laughs> it's just that, that's Look, because I, I definitely catch myself out as well like I'm very lucky to have like a very sort of I would say emotionally aware circle like in terms of the guy friends that I'm friends with, like good friends with as well. It's like, they're very aware of the emotions and the feelings. And I feel like that has rubbed off on me as well, especially my sister. Like my sister is probably like the most mature 20 year old I know ever, yeah. right? Like she, she's beyond me in terms of years in many, many ways. And I think one of those ways is the emotional side of things and the awareness side of things. Because there's times where like I'm aggy or I'm stressed and I would like, you know, lash out or react, especially because we work in the same office together yeah. and we both have a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. So there's a lot of times where I lash out and she, she, she fights back, right? But the way she fights back is never like out of ego. It's just out of facts. And it's like, no, you're just doing this because you're aggy about this and you're taking it out on me. And I feel yeah. like that constant reminder has sort of like taught me also in my relationships to be very aware that did this argument happen because of them or did this argument happen because of my thoughts and then how that mirrored out into reality sort of thing and i feel like that's definitely made me a wiser man over the last year um and it helps because my girlfriend as well she's very sort of on it with communication so like if there is a time where like i upset her she's not going to just hold it in for the next three months and then lash out on me like four months down the line and be like i don't like this she would just tell me like before we sleep, like when I'm calm and I'm relaxed, she'll just yeah. like tell me like, I didn't like how you did this or how you said this. This is how it made me feel. And I just wanted to know that. And it, it like, it kind of opens my eyes that um, like, hey, maybe sometimes I do get angry for no reason or I get angry, but I take it out on the wrong people, even though I'm angry with my situation or my emotion at the time sort of thing. 
so it's definitely made me more of like an aware man per se in the last 12 months yeah yeah relationships are hard it's like there's no fucking handbook in it like no there's no and especially when you're dealing with trying to grow a fucking business and shit and like your life isn't as stable as like just having a nine to five or whatever I definitely yeah, yeah. it definitely stresses. adds definitely adds. yeah I guess it just kind of pissed me off that like things ended with me which was like my doing ultimately but then she kind of agreed it ended at such like a pinnacle point where just as things were like that issue was solved and I don't but know. I, think I don't like, know. Maybe I'm just overthinking it. I'm getting too deep after a glass of wine. <laughs> but I just yeah, it was annoying. It was like fuck. But I, th- I think I think a lot like of that. Months earlier or whatever. It's closure for you, isn't it? <clears throat> I feel. Is that is that it? The closure aspect. Yeah, I feel like there's a lack of closure. Yeah. Because I feel but, like it it, it, ha- it we kind of in a way probably both wanted to break up with each other at the pinnacle of like a stressful time, which is now like over. And it was like uh, looking back, maybe we overlooked a lot of good things. I don't know. I'm just being a fucking emotional soppy cunt. But also, when you break up, you tend to remember only the good things as well. Oh, that's very true, of course. You know, you always tend to remember the good things, not the bad things. But uh, my piece of advice on the closure thing, though, because I went through a lot a lot of that with my really bad breakup. Because um, I never got closure on it. It just sort of happened. Yeah, I feel like I'd, I'd, I'd have had more closure had it happened from my end and hers in a more... When Stable I was in a period. better place, it's yeah. I was in a bad place, like for a lot, for like the past few months, because of it, because my, of what else was happening. But my advice on that though is, um, closure comes from you, bro. And it took in me, it took me a long time to kind of like understand that saying. Um, closure doesn't come from the other person saying something to you, or like a statement or a dialogue that's gonna be like, oh, okay, I'm good now. Like, the feeling of closure is simply your thoughts and the reality that you create for yourself so closure comes from you so th- like what you're saying now like I would have got more closure if it had been in a more stable period of time right so I should just tell myself it's closed yeah because it is right like the reality of the fact is you're broken up you're single now right and regardless of past or future that's where it is now and it's like that acceptance of yeah I, I guess it's always just this is where the, I am the, no- the annoying like if this then that potentially or like is it worth working on or is it a lost cause that's kind of the, the annoying thing that gets in the back of my head when I get deeper about it which is only sometimes mm. and I guess it's right now <laughs> well if it's worth working on then you'd work on it yeah I guess it has to come from both sides isn't it you know and it's prob- that ship has probably sailed but I don't think any ship sails bro I think when it comes she won't to, be watching this shit anyway because when it comes to humans she, when it comes to people I don't think she has people, any interest in the shit I do like I don't think the ship has sailed unless like some really fucked up shit happened right like I feel like female psychology is like really counterintuitive and fucked up <laughs> but it's also fairly simple of like you're doing no contact right now it's probably driving her crazy Try. right it's probably driving her up the wall like she's going mad but also I think you need to ask yourself and I, like if anyone's listening to this that can relate um, and you're going through a breakup is when you asked like in your case when you asked her to move out was it uh, was it the beginning of the end for you was that your intention deep down or I don't really know maybe it, maybe it was I think and I, I did genuinely want to try it and I suppose you, you get a renewed perspective when it actually ends and then like oh fuck but maybe at the time it was um but there's definitely an element of actually want to improve things and I think this will help because yeah I think living with a girlfriend is actually a terrible idea when it's that soon yeah I think if that had never happened we'd been fine which is kind of the annoying part it's like oh fuck's sake why did we do that but it's a lesson right yeah true it's a lesson like it always happens and then you add it to the next thing yeah you know fuck I think if anything you're going to come out of this wiser and like more wiser smarter and like probably more conscious of love and like how you deal with it yeah this is now a relationship podcast yeah. for every, every lad watching we, it's like 99.9% should we cry I don't have any tissues though <laughs> yeah geez, I, I probably struggle to cry to be fair about anything unless I'm like really drunk um, actually no I, I did cry in front of her a few weeks ago to be fair which is kind of deep but I'm just saying that on camera for full transparency that's okay it's okay to cry for, for all these fucking kings that get chin up um, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I felt like it's become a relationship podcast. No, it's good. I like, well, I like these topics. Yeah, I, th- I think it's a relevant section because 
life isn't all business and, and I feel like especially entrepreneurs probably feel like they are not allowed to fucking like have relationships and shit um but I also think like especially romantic relationships probably like affect us the most as men like they they mold us into like our next version of ourselves or future version of ourselves they kind of like time travel us into the future almost because when you go through a relationship and then it ends it really causes you to like reflect on yourself yeah that's very true you know like most most guys get a gym membership after a breakup that's yeah. not that's not a statistic for a reason yeah, yeah you know I already had that to be fair but I've probably been going harder yeah most men start businesses after like some sort of traumatic event that makes them right realize album. yeah you know like so it's it's like relationships I feel like really mold us as men they teach us a lot some lessons are pain, more painful than others for sure but uh, ultimately I think like they always happen for a reason and like it's one, one thing I definitely want to touch on like before we end this is uh, one thing that I'm trying now to live more by is not force things in life like there was a period where like if things didn't go the way I wanted it I would really try to force it to be the way that I wanted it to be yeah and I feel like the more I the older I get the more people I speak to the more I learn one the more I realize I don't know shit <laughs> right and two the more I realize sometimes it's better just to let go and just go with the flow because if it's if it's meant to be I truly do think it will be yours if you have to force it then maybe it wasn't yours to begin with food for thought yeah, interesting. I suppose the question there is always like, you need to make effort but not false it, I suppose. So yeah. yeah, where's the line? But yeah, Christ, you could go down a fucking rabbit hole in that. Before we wrap up then, um, I always have, I've, I've got like two typical questions to ask people now at the end. Firstly, what is the goal with your life now <laughs> over the next few years? And I guess longer term, potentially. World domination and genocide. <laughs> no, I'm yeah, I hope not. <laughs> World War Four. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no. Um, I'm not sure if I can speak about my end goal, my 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 real, real like long term goal, just because. Would you have one? I do have one, but I don't know if like if this gets out public, if it will backfire on me in like four years. But I'll speak. Actually, fuck it. I'll speak. We don't have to. But whatever. Um, you want, any element of goal. No, so I would say like my short term goal over the next like five years is just to build something that I'm really proud of. Business wise, with the agency, with the with the econ brands and wherever that leads. Uh, I want to franchise the econ brands for sure as well. Like go into like kids, home, accessories. Who knows after that where maybe maybe I build a car, who knows? <laughs> or a phone. Yeah. Um but my long term goal is to really reform like the leadership of the world because I feel like the way the way that the world is being run now and you know the dark masters that yeah. puppeteer the news and mainstream media and yeah. all these events like COVID and whatnot I don't think it's in their benefit for the human race to sort of evolve or to get better or to start thinking for themselves and that scares me a lot long term right the whole control aspect so my ultimate end goal is to make a dent in that system or that macro system where I can give freedom of choice back to the people somehow I don't know how that looks like I don't know if that's politics Yeah. I don't know if that's me having like a massive following where you know I can go like this and half of America does a dance when I say or like whatever but that's like my end vision somehow to get there yeah I want to stop the corruption basically and the alternative agendas that yeah, go yeah. against the betterment of what society needs yeah it's, it's pretty deep but that's deep yeah, but that's, pre- that. that's, that's, that's pretty cool. much the end goal yeah cool alright final question but, but, but kind of building off that if you could it's so fucking cheesy but I've started asking everyone if you could give advice to your 18 year old self or 17 year old self whatever when, you get, when you're getting started what would be the best piece of advice like one or two pieces of, of advice in culmination of everything you know now I would say <clears throat> be 
get comfortable with the idea that not everyone is going to be happy with what you do that's one like stop caring and putting importance on when people disagree with you or when they go against your ideas or if they seem stupid or too big right like yeah fuck that shit because that affected me a lot and held me back um one and then two like just fucking try and if you fail doesn't matter you're so young anyways keep trying that's it that's the, the only piece of advice because like a lot of people as easy as and cliche as that sounds it's a lot harder to actually try something new and people usually don't try or start because they get scared that it won't work but my advice for anyone who's like 15 17 18 20 21 you're so fucking young man like even when you're 40 you, you're still young you have a lot of time to go yeah like people have changed their lives around after 50 yeah you, if you're 20 if you're 18 and you're thinking about it do it if you fuck up so what do it again do it another time um, and just keep on doing it until you fucking succeed so that's my advice from my younger self those two things sick yeah cool and on that note and that bombshell <laughs> we'll wrap it up um yeah, Thank it's you, been, been a super interesting episode, I think. I hope I hope you viewers, listeners thought the same. It's um, been a pleasure. That was episode 19 out of out of the 52 in a year that I'm going to try and do every week. Um, if you're enjoying the pod, obviously subscribe, share it to a friend, whatever. Um, yeah, I think we're starting to build some momentum here, hopefully. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed the episode. Cheers for watching, listening, wherever you are. And we'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Take care, guys. Bye.